Hi, this is Lee Ellis with another session of Leading with Honor Coaching. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of talk about differences in our culture today. Well, as a leader, you're going to have to deal with differences. As a family person, you're going to have to deal with differences because it's human nature to be different. You know, it's a key focus of my work for many years and of our book last year. It's titled Leadership Behavior DNA, Discovering Natural Talents and Managing Differences. So today I want to talk a little bit about managing differences. You know, a few years ago, uh, I was working with a Fortune 200 company and I got called by a PhD in their leadership department and HR and said, we've had a report, a filed report of a hostile work environment in this division. I want you to go over and check it out, see what's happening. There's good people over there in leadership, but let's go see what's happening, see if you can help them. So I did. I went in, they took our assessment. We had a team workshop for the leadership team. And as we got into the factors and the traits, we saw that everybody on that leadership team, on the patient factor, everybody was on the fast paced side. No one was on this patient side of that continuum of being patient to fast pace. And as they learned about the struggles, they knew what their strengths were. They're logical, they're quick decision makers, they change oriented, they can pivot, they can do a lot of things, they got a lot of energy. But when they saw their struggles, they knew what probably the problem was. Because their struggles of being very direct, sometimes blunt, challenging, in your face, uh, objective, no radar for feelings, those are their struggles that go with their strengths. Well, when they saw that, they realized that most of their people were on the patient side. And it's always the struggles of the person on the opposite side that irritates you the most. So they saw they were irritating, they were threatening even, it felt hostile to most of the people in their organization. So they realized they had to adapt to meet the needs of their people. They had to be more patient, more thoughtful in how they were responding to them and not the way they were worked with each other because the way they worked with each other was fine. Those same uh, struggles worked fine with their team, the leadership team, but not with their people. Once they saw that, they started to adapt and give it to them the way they wanted it, which was kinder, gentler, uh, less intense. And when they did, that feeling of conflict, that feeling of hostility went away because they did feel hostile to these folks over here. It is so powerful. And think about that. And the thing that I think that separates our organization and the work that we do from others is that we really do focus on strengths, but we also focus on struggles. Because as a leader, if you don't focus on your struggles, you'll never know how to adapt and grow as a leader. And that's where you, if you do, take a 360 or anything, you're going to see it's in your area of struggles are going to show up. And that's where you're going to have to adapt. Okay. Now, we just had a webinar yesterday on uh, managing differences, and it'll play right into it right after this video today. And I hope you'll check it out. And I think it'll be very powerful for you. We had some great stories there and examples, and we brought in the 360 to show that how those struggles were showing up in their actual behaviors seen by their people. So uh, it's been great being with you today. Uh, hope you have a good month and look forward to seeing you next month. Take care and God bless. Uh, we have uh, our special, always special guest today, Hugh Massey and Lee Ellis. And we're talking today via a game show format, again, how to manage yourself and others. And so for those of you who have never attended uh, this interactive webinar series, welcome. We're so glad to have you with us. Uh, again, Lee Ellis and Hugh Massey have worked for years and years together on the idea of using behavior, uh, natural behavior and human behavior in everyday work and life to increase performance and uh, help teams work better together. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. So today we are uh, giving away prizes. So pay attention during the entire event. So after Lee and um, Hugh are gonna go through three scenarios and then we're gonna give the opportunity to 
give you the, the, the opportunity to answer a poll question. And when that question is answered, those of you who get the right answer to that question are eligible for the prize giveaway for each one of these scenarios. So we have some good prizes today, especially the last one is really a, a good one. So uh, pay attention. Also, if you have questions during the event, we can answer a couple of those at the very end of today's webinar. Use the Q&A button on your uh, uh, Zoom webinar uh, toolbar. So look at the Q&A button there, and then also look for the raise hand feature. Make sure you know where that is. Open, the open and use the raise hand feature when I tell you to do so, and we'll, and we'll do it. So welcome, Lee and Hughes. So glad to have you this morning with us. And uh, if you'll just say a moment about today's topic and what we're going to be talking about and why we're talking about it. Hugh? Thank you, Kevin. And good morning, Lee. It, it, it's great to, to be with all of you today. And, you know, we're delighted to uh, go through uh, this topic of managing self and, and others. It's absolutely crucial for leadership. And, and, and why I got into the human behavior business, which is just 20 years ago, and I first had my first interactions with Lee 20 years ago, was because I wanted to help people become self-empowered. And, and that starts with understanding yourself. And as a leader, you know, I've been taking people further on that journey in recent times and in, in, in really helping them discover what their identity is. And that gets to how you create experiences for people, what impact you're going to have in their life. And, and I think when we talk about managing self, if you can get to understanding your identity, as a leader, then you're going to do a whole lot better at un understanding others because, you know, what I always say is the, the, the holy grail in all of this in terms of building yourself as a leader is being able to manage others. To understand your talents or even your identity is one thing, but to be able to manage others is absolutely vital. And I experience it every day. E even in our team, we were having a team discussion the other day about implementing a new solution. And I always like to do reframing to make sure is everybody on the same page, but it's all, it, as that process goes on, it's amazing to think after one hour, how the team could have heard what I thought was a clear message very differently. And that, and that is different behavioral styles at work. I'm an initiator. I go through things pretty quickly, uh, bottom line, quite concrete sometimes with it, although we're trying to move the needle and be creative but how a reflective thinker perhaps on the team will be looking at the, the details and structure and working through the execution plan and, and the more engaging person's thinking, okay, what's the client experience of it? And we've all in different places. And so that's the beauty of human behavior, but we've got to be able to manage all of that as the leader. That's, that, that's the holy grail uh, for us. And, that, and that's uh, what I love doing. And that's why we're in this business and we're hopefully hopefully making this more concrete for all of you as well in, in being able to follow a system. And that's what we will show you today to, uh, to do this, whether you are a coach, consultant, trainer, or are a leader yourself. Thanks, Hugh. You know, uh, something came to my mind as you were talking about that. A uh, long time ago, someone was talking about uh, uh, if you've never seen a full moon, a half moon is pretty bright. And that's almost your standard. Well, when you think about working and working with yourself and others, if you've never really understood the differences in human behavior, you just don't know any better, but you don't know what you're missing and how that can really empower you to understand and manage yourself and coach yourself. That's as a coach, I'm always trying to get the person equipped to coach themselves and I do that every day uh, I'm not easy to manage <laughs> so I'm coaching myself every day trying to be a better listener and be more patient those kind of things but it also helps you understand your people just like you were talking about you're sitting around that table and you realize that they are not like me now I was a young fighter pilot and we thought that everybody would want to be like us. <laughs> it took me a long time to learn, actually a little bit, a few years of marriage to learn that Mary didn't need to be like me. She was like the way she was supposed to be. And I needed to just respect that and celebrate it. Once I learned that, it sure made our marriage a lot smoother. But I was a slow learner. 
So yeah. again, it's the, the half moon and the full moon. What we bring to the table, I think, with our LBDNA assessments and our book that we came out with last year is the content that really paints in the picture so that you can understand how we're different, why we're different, and how to relate to that person in a way that is the most effective because we really want to be effective. I've had people say, leaders say in workshops, say, well, you know, they should adapt to me. I shouldn't have to adapt to them. I said, well, you hope that they will, and they're smart. They will adapt to you. In fact, I tell my people, this is how I like to want you to work with me. I want these eight things. This is how I like it. But then at the same time, I want to know how they like it so that I can be the most effective. If they like paragraphs, I'll give them paragraphs. If they like bullets, I want to give them bullets because I just want them to be the most effective and to feel the most empowered to do their work. So that's kind of a, a kind of an overview to what we're talking about here with understanding differences. That's right. That's right. Well, our gentlemen, are you ready to start the, the first scenario that we're going to present today? Let's talk about um, Jason for a moment. Um, so Jason is an engager uh, style group. And so specifically, this is an individual coaching example where he's transitioning from one industry to another, such as often we see in our training that people are transitioning from, say, military to, to a civilian business or something like that. They're really adjusting their natural behaviors into another type of job. So we're going to talk about what may he be best suited to do. And so if you'll give some comment and commentary on his factors and traits, and then we'll ask a poll question of the audience. So Kevin, I'll, I'll start with this. And just to overview the engager, engagers love to be with people. They like to connect with people. They're usually very social type beings. So to be in some kind of role where they can uh, work with lots of different people, have fun, create engagement, even create experiences for people, that's something that they would love to do. So that's, that's the engager. And as we, when we work with the system, the DNA system, we like to recognize that not every engager will be the same. They will have some different traits. And we're showing the, uh, the eight factors here and the 16 traits. We also have some sub factors that sit underneath. We, we won't deal with those, but you can see that a, a, a strong uh, trait for uh, Jason is he is outgoing. So he's gonna, he's, he, he likes connecting with people there, as I just said, uh, networking, but an important one, which is the strongest one, is the content factor. And you can see that down uh, on the left-hand side towards the bottom. He's got a pretty strong score there, a T-score of 30, means he's inside the top 2% of the population of being content. So, you know, content people like lifestyle. They like a, a more steady environment. Sometimes they can find change hard they'd like to live in a local community so i think networking and engaging in a local community is something that's important for them maybe more so than you know trying to build something that's more global or or, or national so that would be that kind of uh a mindset there in, in in looking for a role and another one is creative so they so jason wants to do something that's creative putting uh being resourceful, putting things together, coming up with different ideas, creating different experiences for for his for his customers. That that that's something that's going to be uh, important. Out out of the box thinking will 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 be important. So they're the, they're the three stronger traits that sit there, and then and then a little bit more in the middle range is is spontaneous at, at a score of forty five. So it's sort of on the edge of. Uh, um, of the middle range. So he will want some flexibility in, in, in the work environment. Being overly structured is not going to be his game, but with the score just sitting there at that edge, he will be able to adapt uh, if needed. But, you know, the key to finding the right role for, for Jason is to do things where uh, he can work in his flow. And then if need be, uh, add a team member on uh, to work with him or to support him that that might complement the differences. So that that's the uh, in, in important thing there. 
uh, with trusting and skeptical in the middle, we, we, we talk a lot about trust in business and in life and to have good relationships in the longer term, you've got to, uh, you know, it helps to be higher on trust. And so building client relationships and customer relationships and engaging them should be a reasonably natural thing for Jason to do. So Lee, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it to you and see whether there's anything else you want to uh, add to what I've said. Yeah, a couple of things that stand out to me. I noticed uh, his mid-range on that first factor. So he can adapt, he can step forward and take charge, or he can go along and be a good teammate, or teammate and support others' ideas or whatever. The thing I think to really understand about uh, Jason here, a couple of other things. One is you look at that second score there on his outgoing, he's going to be very uh, expressive. He will probably need to talk out loud to really think things through. So he does his best work in terms of planning and thinking by being at a whiteboard with somebody to talk to because it will be difficult for him to go in his office, shut the door and think things through. That's just not what these people do. So give him that opportunity and don't judge him when he does that and needs that. He's also going to be more emotional. The very outgoing people like this are just going to be more expressive, but also more emotional. So if he's happy, you know it. If he's sad, you know it. If he's angry, you know it. And it'll come spewing out, okay? The good thing is <laughs> they share their emotions. The bad thing is uh, sometimes they spread them all over everybody and it doesn't feel so good, but they get over them quickly. That's the good thing. He gets over it quickly. Once he's flung it out there, he's over it. He's ready to move on. The next day, he doesn't even remember. Whereas somebody who's very reserved might carry it in their stomach for three months, you know, and haven't said anything about it yet, but I'm just waiting to get revenge. Whereas with Jason, he's just going to sling it out there. Uh, and then just being that spontaneous, he's not too bad. He's still, he's in the edge of the mid range, but he is going to be very flexible uh, as well. So I think that's, uh, you know, just important to keep in, in mind that he is going to be flexible, going to be verbal, He's going to be a generalist more than he's going to be a specific person. So keeping that in mind also. And as you suggested, having a teammate who's different from him, that uh, he understands is different, but also can handle the details and the planning and structure a little bit more. That would make the dynamic team once they learn to work together. Good insights. Good, good insights for both of you. Thank you. Um, so with that in mind, in what, Lee and Hugh have shared. We're going to ask this poll question. It'll come up in just a moment. What type of role would Jason be best equipped from a natural behavioral standpoint? I'm going to start the poll. And if the audience, if you'll choose your anonymous answer, what type of role would Jason be best equipped from a natural behavioral standpoint? Uh, financial management, quality control, event planning, operations. So based on his natural behavior, Choose your poll question answer. We'll take another few seconds to get everyone to answer. All right, good, thank you. Thank you for everyone that's participating. Uh, we're coming to the end of this poll question. Thank you, all right, very good. These are the results and so 71% of you said event planning, while 17% and 4% 8% of the others. So event planning is the correct answer. So that, that is the best job based on these four choices that he is best suited to do. So thank you for sharing that. Those of you who answered event planning as the correct question, would you please click the raise hand button and I will choose a winner. If you chose the correct answer, click Raise your hand and I will um, give the prize away. Paula Landall Smith, congratulations. Thank you for participating uh, today. You answered the question, you get today's prize. And that is going to be the Business DNA Hiring Report. You can use this for yourself or someone that you know. This report specifically helps leaders, recruiters, and HR professionals evaluate a candidate's behavioral insights. And it also has suggested interview questions based on the candidate's unique scores. So we'll be sure to get a copy of that uh, hiring report to you and congratulations. Thank you. And thank you gentlemen for um, giving some insight into Jason's particular um, scenario. Any other comments before we go on to the next scenario, Lee or Hugh? I, I think what we wanted to just conclude on Kevin is to say that with with Jason as an engager 
doing event planning. And Engager will be good for event planning, particularly if he has the passion to do it. And that's something that uh, lights his fire personally. But not all of his talents are, are necessarily a great fit for it for himself solely. In, 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 and if you recall there, Lee and I were alluding, alluding to the fact that he was a little lower on uh, structure. He was more spontaneous and to do events really well. I think you need the uh, outgoing uh, people nature to be amongst people, but you also need some structure to make sure the event happens, it's reliably produced. And, and so that would be the, uh, the, the potential struggle for him being an engager doing event planning. So lots, I, I think there are lots of event planners out there that are engagers, but there's one better profile, in my view, generally speaking, that would be the stylish innovator that we have uh, that style would, would, would perhaps be better as, a, uh, as an event planner because they bring the outgoing and the structure to the table. Yeah, good point, Hugh. You know, uh, one other thing about uh, Jason there and his in that role, Jason in those other roles, those are process step by step by step by step usually long-term process type stuff. An event planner is, okay, we've got this event coming and we plan it and we go execute it and we celebrate and then we start over again. And an outgoing person is adventurous and they like that idea of having that project and it's exciting, it builds up, we get it done and then we move to the next one. Rather than something that takes, you work on, you work on, you work on for the whole year or six months, that tends to be more stressful for them because their attention uh, gets divided very easily. They usually are juggling a bunch of projects. Outgoing people like to have a lot of balls in the air. And being an event planner, Jason would have that opportunity. Of course, he wouldn't need somebody as you beside him, as you said, and some good structure to help out there. But he's good at juggling a lot of balls and event planner probably is gonna be doing that. Yeah, yeah. good. Good insight. Uh, let's go on to the uh, next scenario. This one really interests me personally, and I, I like uh, the the results or the outcomes of this particular scenario. So in this one, Will is a strategist and Carrie is a relationship builder. She also has a, Will is also uh, her boss, and she has more of a support role in the organization. And the, the issue is, is they're having difficulty working together. So their roles are, but their roles are critical to the success of the team. And we use this comparison report very often, as y'all know, in our training every day that we do with different organizations and teams. So would you give us some insights into their particular factors and traits as it's seen on this comparison report example and why they're having difficulty? Lee or he, you can, either one of you can speak uh, into um, this particular scenario. I, I can start. So the way the way I approach these things is to always remember that uh, whilst differences can divide, divide they're also uh, a great asset. So if, if the two of them can learn to harness harness their differences, they can they can have a very uh, successful relationship, and, and and a lot can be done. Uh, it's not easy. And so when I, when I approach these comparison reports, I, I always look for where are the biggest differences first. And then I look for uh, actually where are the closest similarities and are some of those similarities going to cause some frictions uh, because somebody's trying to take control or something like that. So if, if we look at this, this comparison graph here, we've got a strategist being Will and Kerry as a relationship builder. They're pretty much opposite styles, generally speaking. So there, there are often a fair few differences between them. And we can see uh, a large one there between patient and fast paced. So one is gonna move at a, uh, um, being, being Will's probably going to work at, at a pretty, pretty quick pace, be quite logical, rational, might even ask a lot of questions, uh, could be awkward in that, in, 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 in that way. And then, then Kerry is going to be more feelings-based, more sensitive, perhaps move a little bit more slowly. And, uh, and we can see that down below there at, at, with the cautious factor, just be, 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 be a bit more cautious in, in, in getting things done. So 
that that that's a that's a that's a key difference uh, to to look at. Uh, risk taking and, and, and cautious will will want to jump into things and 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 move along uh, quite quickly in in making decisions and take some risks. And at times that might uh, scare Kerry or Kerry in doing her work is is going to be more. Uh, careful about taking risks because she might be scared of losing a job or, or costing the company money or, or just getting it wrong. And, and so therefore some allowances have got to be made there and, and that's got to be understood uh, between the two of them. You, you'll also see there that uh, Will is a little bit more skeptical. So he's not as trusting. He's going to look behind things, be a little bit more analytical ask more questions. Kerry might be uh, more accepting of what's going on and accepting of the people uh, around them. And, and at, at times, uh, Will, may, Will, Will might, as a leader, might have, might have some problems with that if, if uh, she's just accepting what she's told and not investigating it a little bit more, for example. But at the same time, she's going to be very relational and, and thinking about the people and looking after the people, and that's a strength that he needs to look to her, to her in. I think an interesting one that sits here as well is 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 a similarity between the two of them. Down the bottom there, at content, and a lot of the time when we get strategists, most of the time strategists are very goal driven. They're very pioneering. You know, the pioneers are the goal driven uh, people. The content people tend to want a steady workplace environment uh, keep uh, to you know keep a balance and a, and, and a life balance and so both of them are are in the same area there uh, extremely strong scores on on being content and so they're both looking for balance and and but if will is looking for more results out of out of Kerry uh, he may not necessarily uh, get them if she's not pushing herself uh, as hard as he might expect. But there again, he's not doing the same thing himself. He is perhaps a little bit more uh, locked into a routine and a, and a life formula and doesn't want to stretch himself. And that could be causing problems because the organization is driving them towards more results than perhaps what uh, both of them want to uh, step out and, and, and try and achieve. So that, that could be causing some tension there as well. In, 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 in are they getting enough done uh, between the two of them? And they might be looking at each other to get more done. So, so Lee, would you like to add some more to that? Yeah, when I see these two, the two things that jump out to me, you've touched on them already, but I just want to do a foot stomper on them, I guess, is that if you look at that third factor, the fast pace at 40 and her patience at 61, that's two a little over two standard deviations apart. The fast paced people are very objective and quite often they don't have much of a radar for feelings. Whereas with her score at 61, her radar for feelings is very intense. So she knows how everybody's feeling around them. Are they happy? Are they unhappy? And if they're unhappy, that's a big, uh, it's like a big flag in front of her if somebody's unhappy. So she's gonna be picking up on that now that he's got to know that and tone it down. Uh, I'm, I'm 35 or 34 on the fast pace, so I can be too direct, too blunt, and especially with someone uh, like Carrie there to, to the point where I'm just talking about things on a daily basis, but to her, it feels like I'm throwing rocks at her because of the intensity and the directness and the harsh tone that I use sometimes when I'm just trying to make a point. But the, that harsh tone feels like rocks being thrown at her. So if I understand that, then I know I've got to dial it back in that intensity and that will help her to be more effective at work. The other thing is she can be my radar for feelings and tell me how things are going in the, audit, in the office there and how other people are feeling. If I'm the boss, I may not pick up on things that people are feeling uh, about the workplace and she'll pick up on it and she could be my radar and say, okay, I may say, well, how, what are, what's the, the temperature around you? How are people feeling? And she can share that with me. And that way I can be more equipped, better equipped to lead my organization. 
So that's a biggie, biggie for me. And then uh, back to the skeptical one more time. I think uh, uh, if they both understand that, like all of these, it's going to be a tremendous asset because he will ask the tough questions when they need to be asked to keep them from making mistakes. But she's going to be the trusting one. And of course, trust is powerful. Everybody, we, everybody wants trust and wants to be trusted. So she's going to have that side of it and be able to share with him why there's reason for trust here, but also respect the fact that he's going to ask the questions that are going to keep him out of trouble. So again, it comes back to when those two people can really respect each other and see the value and that other person being different. It's like the right hand and left hand being a team and working so well together. But if they don't have that, it's just a mess. And uh, it can be very frustrating and stressful if they don't really uh, value each other's differences. Yep, yep, exactly. You, 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 cho you picked the perfect description there at the end, Lee, that they'll just, it's either an asset or it's a struggle or an impediment uh, in this relationship. So let's move on. Uh, you've given us great information, so let's move on to the... One other, well, let me make one more point there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the thing that's so good, go back to that previous slide if you can, Kevin. The thing that's so good about this, you can see it visually. OK, and see, this takes it away from being a feelings thing, a soft, touchy, feely thing for somebody like, uh, well, he doesn't like touchy, feely stuff. But when he sees 11 points difference, oh, my gosh, OK, I'm there and she's there. Wow. OK, I understand that. It doesn't make it so touchy feely. This is scientific. This is mathematical. You know, this is statistical. And that is so powerful for them to visually be able to see that, especially him because he doesn't understand that stuff so easily. Uh, and I guess that to me is really, really important that they can see that they can see that. And so, okay, now I know how I can adapt to you and you can adapt to me and I can value you and you can value me. And that it's just a powerful thing when they can fall into that role. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you set up the poll question really well. So uh, Will's the leader. So we're asking him to, uh, adjust his behavior. So in this particular scenario, let's go to the poll question number two. We're launching the polling now. What is the best, what's the most important thing that you think that Will can do to work better with Carrie? What can he do? Can he slow down and be patient, be more enthusiastic, pick up the pace to match her pace? Uh, don't set any boundaries and just trust her. Uh, if you'll, audience, if you'll go ahead and select your choice, those of you with the correct answer will give a prize for this particular scenario. What is the most important thing that Will can do to work better with Carrie? Good, we're about 70% of you have answered. 75%, thank you. Thank you for those who have contributed. All right, well, here's the polling. And here uh, I'm gonna share the results. So slow down and be patient, 78% with 9% and 9%, 4% and 9% uh, with the, um, uh, with the other answers. So slow down and be patient is the answer. That is the, in this scenario, this is the best thing that he can do to, to relate to Carrie in a better way and work with her in a better way. So those of you who answered the correct, had the correct answer, uh, would you uh, raise your hand and I will choose a winner for this next prize here. Wow, lots of, lots of good answers. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for, all right. Congratulations, Michael Matsuik. I'm sorry if I said your name incorrectly. Congratulations. You have won the um, prize package of a leadership behavior DNA two book package. So this is, as you know, those of you who already have the leadership behavior DNA book, it's a rich collection of information, 24 chapters in three sections with leadership fundamentals, DNA behavior factors and traits. All of these behavior factors and traits that we're going over today are detailed specifically and outlined in detail in this book, as well as managing team differences. So congratulations, Michael. Thank you for giving that right answer. So any other comments, gentlemen, on uh, this particular scenario? Yeah, I had one other comment. Uh, going back to that 11... Uh, points difference there or whatever, well, 21 points different, two standard deviations apart on that third factor of being uh, uh, fast paced versus patient. Uh, Jason, uh, uh, Will is going to have to coach himself all the time. He can't just see that one time and say, oh yeah, I'll behave that way. 
No, his natural behavior is a pretty strong and he just can't decide to do that one day and forever that takes care of it. He's going to have to coach himself regularly for a good while, a long time, maybe, maybe years. Uh, he'll get better and better, but he's still going to have to coach himself. Mary, my wife and I, and this is this stuff is all powerful at home and working with your spouse, your kids. I mean, it's all the same. OK, my wife and I are three standard deviations apart. I'm 34 and she's 64, roughly. So that's 30 points. So I have to coach myself every day on being more gentle, more soft, more patient, less intense, listening and just toning it down. And I've been working on that for many, many years. And I've gotten a whole, she'll tell you, I'm a whole lot better. But what's going on behind is I'm over here pedaling like this and working at it to, to make sure that I could adapt my behaviors like that because I want to be effective. I love her. I want to, I, we have a great marriage, but I don't want to mess it up. I don't want to hurt her feelings. And so it's a constant effort uh, still getting better, but it's always going to be an effort. I think just to uh, chime in on the back of what Lee said there around coaching yourself. When you're the strategist and you get and you're in a stressful situation, which can happen at any point of the day and even day or after a meeting or you know someone's rattled your cage in whatever setting, that's not the time to go and confront a relationship builder. You you need to be in a place when you're going to interact with a relationship builder if you're a strategist or an initiator where it's calm you've got to have a calm environment for, for them to get a response out of them and 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 when it's a calmer environment it'll be easier to to draw out feelings and to uh to get in their shoes a little bit more i think this is this is what's important to understand the other part is how you ask questions which really follows on from the environment that you know as a strategist you could be pretty cutting in the way you ask questions and confront people and that is not the way you're going to get deal with a, uh, a, a relationship builder. At the end of the day, you've got to more facilitate them rather than question them. And I think if you've got to think of those things as you are uh, working with someone different is what the whole setting is and how you're going to approach them in asking, in asking questions. And when you can do that, it, 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 it just gets remarkably easier to, uh, to build that relationship. You know, in order to do that, Hugh, to adapt your behavior, that takes quite a bit of energy. Yeah. You can't do that all day long. You'd be worn out. But it takes quite a bit of energy. And uh, one of the things that I do is I just remind myself of who I want to be. My goal is to be a good leader, to be a good person, to be a good friend, a good husband. And knowing that what I can do for that person to help them be successful, to help them be happy, to help them be energized, and specifically to help them to be the most effective and productive at work, I'm going to have to adapt my behavior. Yep. And that's the coaching I give myself. And I go smile and I turn down that real stat in my back, turn it down the intensity. And I, as you said, wait till the right time. And I get myself calmed down and wait for the right situation. And then I have that discussion. And it makes all the difference in the world. Because, because Lee, if it, if it, 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 because it does take so much energy to, op to interact with someone that's completely opposite to you, like in this case, mm -hmm. that's why your energy has got to be good when you start that process because it, yeah. it can easily get triggered along the way. So yeah. that, that's really what I'm trying to, uh, to bring out here is yeah. that your own personal energy management is very important when you're interacting and, and then going to coach somebody else or, or, or bring out the best in them. Exactly. And the fast paced people, we tend to be fighters, you know, and a little bit of a little bit of rallying up and we're ready to we're ready to we don't we don't want to go hide. We want to fight. Whereas the more patient person, it's like, eh, let's just go back over here and wait till another day. And so, again, that timing is so important and controlling our energy and controlling our ourselves, knowing ourselves just enables you to do that. I think that's the thing is that a, a strategist or an initiator who's very fast paced there is going, is got to think about their energy a lot more than, than, than somebody else does because yeah. it, yeah. you know, one of our strengths, of course, is that we have more amped up energy and can go at it like a bull in a china shop, which is good for certain settings, but it's not good for uh, relationship settings. Yeah. Just another couple of points. A, a patient person usually needs more sleep, 
A fast paced person needs less sleep. A patient person is more steady and having a bunch of challenges thrown at them one after the other, it just exhausts them immediately. Whereas a challenge or the fast paced person, it's like, boy, isn't this fun? <laughs> and they're just different, you know? There's no good or bad. There's one not more valuable than the other. Hugh, we've got examples of presidents who've been patient and presidents who've been fast paced. I know CEOs, I know one of the most effective CEOs in Atlanta, and he is patient. He's a great team builder, okay? I know great CEOs at a very fast pace. So you can be either one, but you better learn to adapt and value the people who are different from you. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's good. And this next scenario is a good one too. Uh, in that same vein, uh, what we're talking about in the next scenario is the Leadership 360 discovery process. And so both you, both Lee and Hugh have had these scenarios before and Lee, as a matter of fact, had this scenario a couple of weeks ago during a, t a Leadership 360 training with a team. And so in this particular scenario, Di Diane's Leadership 360 report came back with some comments and feedback and she was a bit sensitive about those comments. And so we're gonna compare the difference between her leadership behavior DNA assessment and the actual comments that she received from her peers in her 360 report. And so Lee and he were gonna kind of analyze both her 360 and her assessment and just get some, gain, uh, gain some insight into those. Lee, go ahead. I want you to talk about the factors and I'll go back over her 360. Okay, yeah, since it was the a literal 360 that you had the other day. Yeah, yeah and just to, to preface this, you know, we, 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 at, at our firm is a little bit more unique than others in dealing with 360s in that we have got the natural behavior uh, report or discovery process that goes on first, happens first as step one, and then the 360 is done second, and it's very deliberate. Because if you understand your natural hardwired behavior, which in that we're looking at Diane's here, and she's a, uh, a, a reflective thinker. And if we un and she understands that and buys into who she is, what her strengths and struggles are, it becomes much easier to accept what the feedback might be from uh, the other people that she interacts with, whether they're uh, peers, um, leaders above her, and, 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 and subordinates and or clients. So, you know, for, for Diane as a leader who, who is a reflective thinker, you can see there, you know, her cooperative trait at the, at the top there on the top left is reasonably strong. So as a leader, you would expect her to be quite collaborative. She might be a little hesitant in making uh, decisions quickly. She'll want to, again, because she's collaborative and group orientated, she'll want to defer to the team. She's not going to be that hard nut, uh, take it or leave it uh, leader, my way or the highway. Uh, but she might come with that not being as decisive. In being reserved, she's going to be thinking about things for a bit longer. She might sit quietly in meetings and trying to surmise what's going on and listening to all the feedback. But that doesn't mean there's nothing going on and that, uh, uh, you know, that she's switched off or anything. Uh, but, but the struggle with that is that she may not rev up the team and make them feel engaged with and, and, and connected to, and therefore, uh, particularly the engagers that are, that are opposite to her might feel a, a little lost with that because they want constant engagement. She'll be a feelings-based leader, so she'll understand where every team, person, team member is at uh, in terms of their feelings. But she might have difficulty with that in confronting people because she doesn't want to hurt their feelings. Uh, having to provide constructive feedback for, for a team member would be harder. Uh, at, at, and at times, you know, if a really difficult decision to make, got to be made about, about the business to get better results, that, that can be more challenging. But, you know, we've all, as, as Lee's been saying all the way along, we've all got a starting place with that and you've got to adapt. And then she's going to be quite structured. That's very good for uh, building reliable systems in the business, ensuring that there's stability in the business. But again, it, it, it can get in the way if, if she's too awkward about it and doesn't want to change at the right time. And that's where you see the anchored being, you know, a little bit fixated on things being stuck, you know, stuck in the in 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 history and what we know rather than exploring the future in new ways. So 
you know, there's a lot of strengths for her as a as a as a leader, uh, and particularly a leader of 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 a probably more established business is going to be easier for her than than working in a very dynamic environment. But that's her starting place, and if she can own these strengths and struggles. Then the feedback that she might get from her teammates uh, will be easier to take. So I, I, I will leave it there, and we can move to the next part and let T Lee uh, deal with how, how she was evaluated by her team. Yeah, it was interesting. Uh, she's very reserved, and so she's not going to be sharing much on emotions. That would be what I would expect. These are her. If you look, this is. Uh, up at the top of the screen there, it says your leadership performance struggles. So these were the lowest ranking items that she was rated on totally. And so you can see uh, sharing emotions and feelings was not very strong. I mean, it's okay, but it wasn't as strong as uh, it was one of the lower items. Comfortable listening openly to others' feedback about his or her performance. Uh, the... Reflective thinkers do not take criticism very well because they're perfectionists. And uh, you got to really be careful with them giving them feedback. So that one, you know, with uh, other people, other some of the others, like outgoing people, they can kind of handle it and, okay, we'll move on. We got it. For giving others, uh, reflective people who are reserved and more uh, uh, analytical, they tend to hang on to stuff and it takes them a little bit longer to forgive because they can internalize it and chew on it. It's just going on down here for a long time, maybe. Motivates and inspires others. By nature, they're not uh, enthusiastic with her profile. That's not one of her strengths is to be enthusiastic, which we think of as being motivating. So she's got to have to motivate people in her own style. And what is that? Well, it may be just quietly going to them and saying, you know, you're doing a great job and you're making us all look good. That might be all it takes. But for her to go do that, that will not be a natural thing for her. She'll be adapting to do that. But I coach people like her, okay, how can you go back, go down there and encourage this person in a way that they feel connected, where they feel valued, where they know that you see their the value in them and their significance in what they're doing and just come up with a good couple of sentences that's accurate and true and go down there and deliver it and check it off because they're good at checking things off. And then respecting and responding appropriately to the emotions of others. That would probably not be a strength. It might be. It might be. If their emotions are calm and sad, then this person would probably respond to them very well. If they're more uh, angry and loud, and that sort of thing, uh, this person probably wouldn't respond so well. And probably if they're loud and funny, they may not respond. It's like, okay, let's go back to work, you know? <laughs> so these things really just kind of fit right in with what you would predict from looking at her scores um, on her LBDNA report. Is there another slide, Kevin? There is. Just personal comments. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it goes back to what you and I were saying earlier, though. Everybody can be a great leader, but we everybody has to learn to adapt. You know, we had uh, on that webinar we had in December, which is like this one, except we had two guests on. One was a retired four-star general, Air Force general, who's a friend of mine, who was one of the greatest leaders in modern times in the Air Force. Uh, I'd known him for about 12 or 14 years when he retired. He's a very people-oriented guy but he shared how he had to learn to adapt and be tough or he would have never made it. He would never have made it past his first leadership role. And the way he made it was his boss called him up and said, Hey, you got a problem down there with so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so, and it's pretty obvious. So either you fix it or I'll come down and fix it. And if I come fix it, you're in trouble. <laughs> and so he learned to adapt and he made four stars and everybody loved him, but they knew he could be tough when he needed to be tough. And it really comes down to that. You have to be all great leaders, the really great ones. They know how to connect with people and let them feel so they feel valued in those relationships. They also know how to be tough and hold them accountable and set standards 
because you have to do that in order to accomplish the mission. And to, when you learn to do both of those and you have good character underneath, you're going to be a great leader. You're going to be trusted. It also means that you're probably secure enough within yourself, enough self-worthiness, security, comfortable in your own skin, that you can be genuine and vulnerable. And when you're genuine and vulnerable with those other things we just talked about, Everybody wants to follow you. Everybody wants to be around you. You just attract them like a magnet. Good, good feedback as usual, as usual. Well, so we both compare, what we've done is compare her 360 report to her leadership behavior DNA assessment. We understand uh, that it's accurate. So the poll question that we're gonna ask here is, was Diane's leadership 360 report accurate based on the reviewer's comments. So I'm, that's going to come up on your screen if you'll answer the question. Was Diane's leadership report 360 accurate based on her reviewer's comments? Yes, no, mostly true, not sure. Feel free to answer your, provide your honest answer and we'll look at the results of this particular poll question. We're going to be giving away a prize to the ones who answered the correct answer. All right, very good. Thank you for answering that question. So in this case, we said 65% of you said mostly true with 24% and 12% accordingly, yes or no. Uh, the uh, correct answer is mostly true and Lee and Hugh will address that in just a moment. So those of you who answered the correct answer, would you please raise your hand and we will give away another prize today for this particular question. Very good. All right. Thank you. Congratulations, Kathy Daigle, for your correct answer. Uh, in this particular question, you are getting the Leadership 360 Discovery Process to use with you or someone you know. And this is a fantastic prize. And uh, it, well, what, the, what the Leadership 360 really does, it has 75 questions to help provide feedback on real-world leadership effectiveness in seven categories that you see there. Leadership efficiency, results drive, effective communication, and so on. So congratulations, Kathy. And this is the report that we were referring to in this particular scenario. Lee, Hugh, why did we say mostly true in this particular situation? Well, I would say mostly true because uh, you don't want to put too much weight on things and just, you know, flip overboard. And generally it's true. It's true enough that she needs to listen to it. But at the same time, you don't want to let that overwhelm you. You know, I say to people, and we have a, a work a leadership development plan that goes with this. So when they, after they've read it and studied it and we've talked about it, they actually work through it. And we say, if you pick out two things uh, kind of generalize two things out of this whole report that you can work on for the next six months or a year and you can figure out those and also pick out three things that are your strengths that have been validated in your 360 then you've that's that's a wonderful gift to you if you've got that information so we don't want to take it too too seriously but yet seriously but not uh, get into it so much that you feel beat up on uh, it's, I've never seen, I don't think, a one where somebody's been beat up on. And so I always tell them, listen, don't just let that one comment pull you down. Lump them together and look at it and realize that you're a good leader. Your boss would have already been in your face if you weren't. Are you doing a good job? You'd already know about it. We're just trying. This is, this is all about helping you grow and develop. It's not about you for your performance report. Okay. It's just about how you can grow. And if you look at it that way, I think that makes it feel much better and more useful. Yeah, Kevin, just for me to make a wrap up point, if you could just go back to the uh, the previous slide that you had up. And I'll just go on to one point there. And if you go down to point number seven under lead, leadership performance struggles, motivates and inspires others. And her assess, assessment of herself was three. So, you know, th th this is rating yourself from one to seven. So she doesn't think that she would motivate and inspire others a lot. And if you look at the reflective thinker style of being a more reserved person, you would think that is true. But the team is actually saying a score of 5.47. Now, that's not the highest score of seven, but it is two and a half points higher than the three. And so her team actually think and feel 
to a large degree that she is inspiring them and motivating them. And so that's a blind spot on her behalf about herself, which is probably something that you would expect from a, a reflective thinker to be a little bit that way. Uh, but I think it begs the question for that blind spot uh, to be explored by Diane so that she understands what she is actually doing right to inspire the team. And therefore, the next time uh, she does this, she may not self-rate herself at three. She might rate herself at five or six. And hopefully in, in that process, she steps it up even more in terms of motivating and inspiring others. I'll just add one. I'll just add one thing to that, Hugh. Over the years, I've noticed that um, people who are more planned and methodical, when you ask them to make a list of their strengths and struggles, they'll always list their struggles first because they're very critical of themselves. And so, as a leader, I try to encourage uh, methodical people to believe in themselves more and to see the value in themselves and focus on that more than on the, yeah, you need to know your struggles, you need to work on them, but don't beat yourself up. Yeah, I know when I first uh, got my own 360 done quite a number of years ago now, and I, I was happy with most of it. I mean, I, I, I was still young and I'm still young now, but developing a, 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 as a leader going through it. And there was one in there, Lee, that said celebrating team successes. And I got rated very low. Well, I'm an initiator, you know, uh, very results driven, you know, to me. Okay, we had a win. Well, let's keep on, let's keep on doing it and have a, and, and, and get some more and forget to take the team out for lunch or just to stop by and recognize that. I thought I was doing it. But I clearly wasn't. And, and so that was a, 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 a big lesson in life. And it's one that I still remember now because I know I've got to keep working at that one. Mm -hmm. Good point. Well, this has been fun, Hugh. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's always good to be able to go to the reports because that's the power, I think, of, of, of what we have. And, we, you know, Lee, we want people to be self-empowered. The more that you know about yourself, the better you're going to be able to step up as a leader. And, and then naturally manage those differences. But, you know, this, this, this puts it into your conscious space and being able to see the differences, as you said, makes it more objective and doesn't have to be such an emotional conversation. People understand, okay, this is me. I can understand, accept and respect why uh, I'm, I'm behaving this way, why somebody else is. And, 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 we can, and we've got a framework to work on it. And I think that's really the power of what we're doing. Great points. Great points today, gentlemen. We can't thank you enough for your expertise, insight, experience, and just freely willing to share everything with our audience today and with me. Uh, just a couple of reminders at the end. Please go visit the website to get lots of free information, free downloads, training information, all kinds of things on our website. And also, we're basing everything today on the brand new award-winning book, Leadership Behavior DNA. We're very excited. It just received two awards uh, in the self-help category as well as uh, business and leadership. So we were just ecstatic about the awards recognition. Go to leadershipbehaviordna.com slash book to get your copy. Congratulations to the winners today, gentlemen.